Good. So, how should we start? I'm not sure. Uh, also, it seems that we are the only both who use um, a webcam or a microphone. I'm, yeah, right. I'm not sure. They, they all came to see you, brother. They all came to see you. Um, really? Yeah. I don't Why know. is that? I don't know. The um, I I so I'm I'm still a noob. I'm still learning how to organize stuff. But I can definitely um, turn it ref. There you go. I can definitely show you some of the things that I've done for the past three games, and mm -hmm. uh, as well as. Um, some of the things that I've run into challenge-wise with source control, I don't know if that'll help, but that's definitely some of the things that have, have helped me. Um, I guess what would help is what a, like when I saw your post originally, like I saw like one response, you were like, hey, it'd be nice if somebody could help talk about organization. Mm -hmm. And then they said, just organize it. I'm like, that's not, that's not very helpful. So what, what would be, uh, I guess, useful to you or what are the challenges that you were running into from an organizational perspective? Uh, that was a question or it was a rhetorical question? Well, just, I, I remember when you posted on the, the community, like you said, you know, it'd be nice just because I'm having challenges from a, an organization standpoint as the game gets larger, I got all these assets, where do I put them? You know, yeah, right, right. Like, so what, uh, is there something specific or is it just like the whole thing or what? Mm, I think basically the whole thing of um, how do you organize the work? How do you organize the creative processes? How do you uh, stay on track of all the different things that you use? Uh, for example, I use different... I, I, I really like to work with the crowd, so I, I, I use a lot of stuff like um, creative comment pictures or ask people for their ideas or their music or stuff like that. And I have to keep track of um, where do the pictures come from, what license does apply to them, and what kind of people have been part of the project and stuff of that. So that is kind of complicated to keep track of. But also, um, for example, if you have different scripts and you have people you, to help you with the scripts, um, the thing is um, to know what has changed. Or if the person says, okay, I, can't, I don't have any more time to work on the project, um, how do I tell the other person what in the script is what and stuff like that? So that can become pretty uh, complicated because it has so much different layers. Uh, from for game development and at the same time you don't want to lose all the creativity and the energy in the project with all the the organization now things so that's kind of has to be in a um you know um level or something so that makes sense um so i can i can tell you what doesn't work and what i've tried it doesn't work so you cannot make the same mistakes um i, mm -hmm. I know from a a process perspective, some of the things that have helped me both in app development and game development. So it's it's not nothing's changed there, um, and I can also go over some assets. So I just didn't know. And if anybody else had any, they wanted to submit first. I'm looking at all the little squares at the bottom. All right, well, I'll, I'll I'll start some of the notes that I had uh, I made this week when when you originally set this up, and then if anybody's got anything to add or whatever. Mm. Uh by the way, just one question before you start. Because for, before you said um, they can just see me, do I have to click something so you are on the main screen when you talk? Or just click this picture at the bottom. There you go. You see them. Ah, okay. And then it changes for everybody, or just for me? No, it just changes for whoever clicks. So you can view whoever you want to. Ah, okay. Like I'm looking at Greg. Hi, Greg. I see. Okay, great. Okay, so go on. Sorry, it was just a technical uh, question. I got some grounds in my coffee. Gross. All right, so the um, I think the, the biggest <laughs> issue I've always had is, is, like you said, from an idea perspective, you want to capture everything, right? And a lot of that time, mm -hmm. from a, a right brain perspective is writing everything down, throwing it against the wall, and then destroying things that don't work, right? So I mm -hmm. found that I use notebooks. Uh, Terry Payton, I don't know if he's here today. He's from Oz. He does that a lot. He has this massive notebook of just sketches and weird ideas. And if you go back to some of his Google Plus posts and compare the games he works on with the notebook, you only see like 10%. So I think a lot of that is he'll throw down all of his ideas, capture it, and then um, six months later, he'll come back to a notebook and say, you know, I, I wanted to make that game. Right? So you had some really good capturing there, which I thought was, was nice. And I do the same thing. Um, from a team collaboration standpoint, uh, I, I like mm -hmm. to use uh, Trello. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen Trello, but it's, it's just from a, an actual... I have all these tasks, and I'm trying to divvy them up between a team. I've outsourced to a, a music composer, or I have an artist that I'd like to do uh, some work with, you know, those kind of things. So um, mm -hmm. Trello really helped me identify, you know, who was who was dealing with what, if that makes sense, and who was um, basically who assigned to what task. 
as the project went on, it was also nice because um, I knew what things I could actually cut. So, for example, if um, like one game a month has been the, been the biggest challenge of the last week or the last two weeks, I'll realize I have nothing, you know, no, no time left, and I have to really significantly cut. Um, what is it called? Like I have to, you know, basically cut the uh, a lot of the main features, right? And what are those things? And Trello just lists all the things out that I can actually, you know, destroy, right? Which is really nice. Um, it's it's sad to cut functionality, but at least I know. Okay, if I focus on this and you focus on this, then we know, you know, where we're at. We have a, a better scope. If it's just a bunch of lists on paper, you can't move those around and say, all right, this is the chunk of work mm-hmm. that I can do in this amount of time, right? So, okay. Um, I'm trying to open Trello so, to show you. So it's it's kind of a, a project management. Yeah, tool. but like the, the problem I've had with like uh, Pivotal Tracker, um, mm-hmm. uh, version one, Rally Dev, like all these agile PM websites, they're so complicated. Like even Jira, right? They're made oh, for like large teams, you know, tracking bugs. Whereas Trello is like, look, yeah. here's a task. It has a color. Do it, right? And it's just a list. Okay. Of columns. So, do, do you know Basecamp, Basecamp's another uh, which group. is also probably, very simple? The problem I have with Basecamp is that it has a lot of features uh, dealing with uh, team collaboration with files, with designs and everything else, as well as assigning tasks and things like that. And that's fine. Um, but I guess mm-hmm. my, my challenge with uh, that is most of the games that I'm currently working on are really small. Some of the software that I deal with is also really small, right? So I haven't, mm-hmm. I guess, had the opportunity to... Um, you know, work on something that large from a game perspective. Most of it's been very simple and just trying to get ideas together and say, all right, I don't want to lose these, these ideas and these tasks that I need right, to do, right. but I need to organize them. So oh, I see. share okay. my screen. You can actually get a better understanding since we're all visual people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I've used Trello before. It works really well in conjunction with Symphonical, which I've linked in the chat. What was the other one? Um, Symphonical. It's, it uses the, it's there in the, the text. Um, okay, cool. It uses a lot of tight integration with uh, um, G+, so it's got built-in Hangouts. It uses the sort of standard Scrum board. There you go. Mm-hmm. It's a really nice piece of kit. The two of them work really well together. I'm not going to get anything done tomorrow. I'll just play with this. <laughs> yeah, and the good thing about Symphonical is they're on G+, so they're really active in terms of responding to criticism or suggestions. Oh, they actually are on Google+. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and their their integration with G Plus is just incredible. So, how well do they worth get luck. an API to work with Google Plus? I don't think they have actually. Because that, that that's mm-hmm. the big, biggest frustration is there's so many features on Google Plus you'd like to integrate with with the team. And it's like they don't really have an API. It's been a little frustrating. Um, so here's an example of uh, I don't know if you can see my screen, but Plane Shooter was one of my first attempts at taking a game that I've been sitting on for eight months and trying to just organize everything I had to do right. And I basically had to do things I need to get done. The things that I'm currently working on, and uh, that that can change because sometimes I hit a brick wall, or I get tired, or I just don't want to work on it today. I don't want to do art today. I want to do code, right? So I'll drag that in there. Mm-hmm. And say I want to. I have to. I want to do some art today. Done is things that I I feel are done working, and they're not like ninety percent there. Like they are physically done, right? Canned was. I, I don't ever create this column until the last two weeks of the month, and I get really frustrated. And I'm like, I'm not going to finish my game this month. Let me throw things that I'm not going to get done over there, right? And then that way I have things left. Um, what's nice is that you can color code each one of these tasks by a certain label or color. So, for example, all code is orange. All uh, you know, bugs and stuff are yellow. And then green is basically the things that you've seen, right? So from a, a collaboration perspective, you can see who's act dealing with what particular tasks and things like that, right? So you can see who's worked with what and everything else, as well as additional members and what their tasks are. They have deadlines, uh, due dates and stuff, but I, I've never really heard of due dates working in software, so I just, I never use them. What I, what I do make sure is I leave a comment, because sometimes I won't come back to a task for like a, a week, so it's helpful to remind myself where I go. It's kind of like a to-do in code, but it's like, why did I create this task, right? So Trello was really nice for, once I had a notebook of ideas I wanted to do, it was helpful to organize, all right, here's the block of work. Can I really do all of this stuff in a month? Or can I do it all in a week? If I had some help with the art, could they do it in a week, right? So that's what I've been using uh, Trello for, for actual organization. But now I, now I want to try Symphonical, just because Ted says it was awesome. Yeah, they work really well together. 
Open capture. Go away. Uh, let's see. So that was um, Trello. What else? So from a creative process, yeah. I think everything that I found is Google+. Plus. I mean, I don't know about you, but some of the best creative conversations I've had with people has been on Google+, Plus rather than email and Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, one thing um, I just I will post a link in the chat uh, for an open document that we can use uh, to write in different things that we think are great tools for different stuff, so we can remember uh, the things afterwards. Just to have a list. So I, I hope you can see the document and edit it. So if you want to write something, yeah, if you have some nice tools okay, or something. Yeah. Um, just write them in there, so we have something afterwards, so we can look at and say, okay, these and these ideas have come up. Um, yeah, it's it's a pretty cool tool, especially because you have these lists of, like you said, you can can something or you can say, I do this right now and not the rest. So I think to have a focus on something and have a good idea of how long stuff takes and how long it really takes, not just you mentioned it would take, is very uh, very important for the for the workflow. What is with all these kind of pictures? Because they, they came to see you. I told of, you. They want to see you. Yeah. Your, your face right there. <laughs> it's kind of. I don't know what it is, and it's kind of um, distracting. But you're, anyways, you're famous. You're taking photos. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I think the, the discredit I had with Trello was that I'm not very good at time estimations, so I, I've been a little mm -hmm. challenged with okay, this task is you know like all the blocks like look the same shape and the same size and same color, right? But some of those pieces of mm -hmm, code mm -hmm. could take a week rather than a day. So it's been very bad at, at projecting right. time estimations. I haven't figured that part out yet. And uh, Chris, mm. you know, the guy who organized one game a month, Pomodoro. he was like, dude, it's, it comes with experience. You'll get it. It's like, okay, I've been doing this for 12 years. Am I ever going to get any better? <laughs> you know, so that's one thing Trello really hasn't helped with. I think from an agile perspective, like if you're working with a team, you know, uh, Rally Dev and version one and stuff have definitely, you can see the velocity over time. But, you know, with gaming, mm -hmm. you don't have iterations that can stand on their own, right? With gaming, you have to release it with music and some form of art, or it's not a good game, right? So I haven't really figured that part out yet. I don't know what tool allows me to do that other than experience, and so that's, that's been a little Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there is uh, something that I, that I wanted to say that's kind of, uh, I think, in this direction is um, that um, it is interesting that in, in game or maybe in other art forms also um, that you have this um, separation of um, producing something, being innovative and being creative, which are very different processes. Um, but uh, the two parts of that, which is uh, innovation and which is um, uh, production of the stuff is very technical. So innovation is not really creative, it's just something you do, like industrial design where you create things that are interesting, but it's not, uh, not, that, uh, not that creative or not in the way bringing life stuff like art or creativity is. And so for these two things, like uh, the innovation part or the industrial design part, um, they, they have been figured out very well by the industries. So it's kind of not really um, useful to rethink them or try to re-innovate them. Uh, you can use tools for that. Like there is something, it's called the journey of the hero, which is basically, uh, this is the basis of every film, every novel, every game um, that you that has kind of this uh, hero trip in it, where someone has problems and then he has to self save someone or solve the problem, and then he comes back as a hero and is kind of admired for it. It's the classical scheme of almost everything that you see in a game or movie format or novel. And um, this is built up like it has, I think, 12 steps, how this works. And if you read the 12 steps and you think about almost everything you have seen or uh, in entertainment, you will see, wow, this is exactly how it's it's done. It's not that kind of big variety. And if you have these tools, um, this can help you to streamline the process of creating a game story and of to see what elements do I need, how should the, the, um, the, uh, the enemies uh, be created, what kind of, how can I put the hero in the world and stuff like that. Um, another thing that is interesting is there are pretty good books about where do I have the book right now? Um, is um, about character creation. How do you create a character? What does a character need to be a nice guy, to be a bad guy, to be the sidekick and stuff like that? These are also stuff that has been figured out very well. 
and um, you can read it in books how they are created, what elements you need. Of course, you can create them very individually, and you need a lot of research to create a very good character. Um, but the elements you need in a character and why they work in a movie have been figured out and are more or less technical. So if you know them and you you make kind of this um, skeleton of, of things that you need and just fill them with your own imagination, it very much makes the process easier of um, organizing your um, creativity. Just it, It's like ba basically it's, it's like a Christmas tree and then you hang all the stuff on it that you like but the Christmas tree is the same shape all the time and so you have you have a, f a fundamental structure then you can base on your creative your creativity and that makes it much easier to, that to work. That sounds very organized. It's also kind of, <laughs> it, it, sort it's of... kind of, a, it's kind of a, a tool to organize stuff without being a tool like a base camp or other things. You know it's just more like a, a basic structure. But I think it, it 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 works very well. I mean, it works very well for the mainstream. Not not everybody wants to make mainstream, and you can of course use also these kind of things to go the other way and make exactly the opposite of them to be more in the artistic way or more in the uh, I'm, I'm just to be different. So it doesn't. But it's it's kind of good direction to give them. So yeah. Well, that's uh, <laughs> I, I feel like really stupid now because like a lot of that stuff, I still feel like. From a software perspective, I know a lot of that. From a gaming perspective, I don't. And I feel like the whole uh, one game a month thing for me has just been every month trying to learn about execution and about how do you build this stuff. So if I were to learn about, okay, here are the aspects of a character and a story, you know, plot, narrative, hook, and everything else, then I could actually execute. Right now, my biggest problem has been execution. Um, just like, you know, why is my game loop not working? Like, you shouldn't have those kind of problems. You know, if you're building the game, right? When when you're an app developer, it's kind of known you should have good tools. You know how to use them. Hmm. You know how to code. You know how to actually use a component framework. You know how to use an MVC framework. If you don't have those, you know, basics or core, it's very difficult for you to actually produce an application. You know, that's your vision, right? So, so a lot of things that you said mm -hmm, from a mm -hmm, game mm -hmm. perspective, I feel like I need a lot more execution no. practice <laughs> before I before I can even get to that level. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think this is also a big part of it, which is I think um is a mistake that it, not really a mistake, but it's something that every creative person makes. That if you're creative and you want to create something, you start at the point where you say, I am going to be creative. And um I think um, to, to have a good game that works for a lot of people, um, to try to be creative is exactly the thing you should not do. Uh, so try to be at least uh, the, the least creative that you can be, because every part of getting in uh, creativity is all these parts where you lose the game and where you kind of um, you start to, to get so much stuff into the game that on one side nobody will ever understand what the game is about and on the other side you have so much things that you have to develop or think about or, or do that uh, you just lose track of it and then the, 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 the game is just going down uh, the river. Um, so if, you, if you're a creative person and you turn off your creativity or try to push the creativity out and just create something simple, um, there is so much creativity left inside of the game that it's still really cool. And that they, they also, a good thing is to say, um, I want to be creative, but at the same time, I use inspiration for that instead of my own creativity, because your own creativity, creativity is working all the time. And um, if, you, if, if you use inspirations from outside, you have the benefit that there is already a structure you can build on, and that people know what you're building on, and at the same time, um, it's you can do it in a very unique and creative way. For example, if you think about the movie Matrix, it's a very old story. This is like a 5,000 year old philosophy of are we dreaming or are we awake? Is this a real world or not? It's the kind of the oldest question of mankind, yet this uh, movie is, is seen as one of the uh, very new and creative ways of seeing uh, how we interact as social beings inside of computer networks and stuff like that. So I can remember uh, professors talking about at the university and Matrix and wow, it's such a great movie and this and that. But the question itself is very, very basic and very odd. And also you have these all these 
old characters that you know from from ancient um, Greek um, stories. Even the main character is called Neo, so it's very very simple from the structure. But they made something very interesting uh, from it because they they uh, combined five hundred uh, five thousand year old philosophy with uh, high tech technology of internet and computers. And so just the mix itself was enough creativity to make a great movie. And this is kind of the thing where. Um, uh, I think uh, to to try to be less creative and and be more productive and create something which is uh, creative enough uh, for a good game or for a good product. So yeah, which I think is also a tool to not try to be creative. It's kind of a tool of creative. Uh, I think Brave is a lot like that. Like he he got really frustrated. I remember the author of Brave, where he spent a lot of time trying to create a game that was his vision. That wasn't, I mean, it wasn't very creative. It was, the, mm -hmm. it was the, the standard 2D, you know, guy on a journey to save some, you know, he's the protagonist trying to save some girlfriend. And, like, he claims that no mm -hmm. one got it. Like, a lot of people didn't get his vision, right, of what that game was. And he wasn't trying to be creative in the aspect of game mechanics. Like, he had the standard, you know, jump, jump on this, and the rewind time was actually, you know, mm -hmm. a, night, a neat trick off of what's already been done before. But he had a lot of room once he had mm -hmm. this core mechanic that you, you just room. said was already well defined, a 2D mechanic going right, that he could actually really tell a story. And even in doing that, only a very few people got it. <laughs> but it didn't matter because the game was still significant. You know, because he did very, very well, made lots of money, and he was very successful at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also, it's, it's kind of, the interesting thing about his game is um, he... Um, I think he got this idea of rewinding time from something. They they had a discussion on the online forum, if I remember it right. And then he wanted to he wanted to make something completely different with it. So the first attempt, I think, was that you have a billiard game, so your pool table, and you can predict where the the balls go, and you can um, kind of rewind the time and then play these different moves and it to make it more interesting and more easy to play a pool and then he figured out it's kind of not working at all for him it's kind of crappy um, so he he tried this other jump and run uh, which I think he makes on a he made on a trip just a journey he spent some time off and uh, took his laptop and and just built a little bit of these levels and the funny thing is if you look at braid it is um it's just simple. It's Super Mario, nothing else. It's Super Mario with the ability to rewind time. The story is basically the same. You have the princess, she gets abducted, and then you run through the levels, jump and run over these little nut things that you can jump on the head, and then you come to a castle, and at the castle you have the dinosaur that says, oh, the princess is not in this castle. So this is Super Mario, which also Super Meat Boy is. It's also Super Mario. So um, the, 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 this is uh, the, the, exactly what I meant. They, they got inspired by this thing. They had a one idea which was enough for all of the game, and uh, the rest was just, okay, let's build it. And don't try to do this and that, and there could be a merchant, and I could buy new features, and then there is an upgrade, and this and that. We just, just had this, this one thing, and um, that's it. Not my phone. <laughs> I don't know. So, and this is, this is what I find very hard for myself, to know when it is enough, to know, okay, this is a good idea. I shouldn't go any further. Just stay there and try to put it in the different tools and work with people. Um, so this is kind of for, for me. I find it very hard to figure out. Okay, this is this is enough of, of a function, and not don't do any more. Yeah, I find a lot of the the ideas that I've seen people post on one game a month, the indie game group, a lot of others, even Newgrounds back in the day. A lot of their ideas were very sound, and the mechanics mm -hmm. were actually, for the most part, pretty tight. Um, I think their issue was they didn't feel personally that it was good enough, and yet you'd see this, you know, thirty mm -hmm. comments that said, "Dude, this is great, finish it." And I don't know what it is on some artists no, that they no. don't understand. Like, if thirty people say it's awesome, like they're not lying to make you feel better. Like they really, honestly want you to finish this mechanic or make two more levels or something. And uh, I, I, I find that a lot of people who ask me or ask others alone. They're in this bubble. They don't actually ask for feedback. I think if they were to actually take their builds that are on their computer, put it on a blog or put it on a Google Hangout or put it on Facebook or something to say, is this good enough? I guarantee you they would have a good metric of do I need to work some more or not. I think that's uh, 
nowadays it's hard not to do that when you have all these you know social media outlets to actually ask those questions you know social media outlets to actually ask those questions mm. yeah <laughs> All right. Okay. So I have um, I have yeah. like two other things. Go ahead. I I, I wanted ahead. to say something, but I lost. Uh, I forgot what to so say. I sorry. Sorry. A, go on. I go have on. A few other things <laughs> I can show about organizations that are bad and some that are good. This will help. Um, uh -huh. So the uh, I, I have a company that we basically do consulting with, and what what it is is, you know, we we work for various banks and various insurance. And um, I also have a lot of Lewis stuff I do on the side, right? And both of those always go through GitHub. I know there's, you know, Bitbucket and everything else. But they, I think the, the, mm -hmm. well, the main point of GitHub is really source control, right? Is where it started originally, was to have a better source control system for people. And I know a lot of people look at Git and get very intimidated, and I think that's very valid. Um, Git was, I think, very popular with programmers because it's very complicated. Like that's kind of the crux of why it's so cool it's because it has rebase and merge and all these very complicated things. But at the end of the day, it's like, here's code that you and my friends mm -hmm. can see. Here's images and assets for our game or our software that my friends and I can see. And uh, we've you know, done some amazing collaboration. You know, back in the days of SVN and source control, it was lame. But now you can go to GitHub or Bitbucket.com. You can create a project, very simply. You can download the code. You can look at the code. You can actually make comments on specific, you know, uh, images or um, actual lines of the code, and you know, like talk about it and actually collaborate and see who changed what. Uh, for a project that we're doing with a framework, um, I actually have issues assigned to me that I have to do. Um, some of the open source things that I've created, I've gotten issues from the community where they say, hey, this is a bug, or could you add this feature? And you know, a lot of times it was very complicated to do this with code or projects. Some of these things, people I don't think are valuable. And you'll find GitHub projects that have been sitting up there for a year. Somebody will discover it, and then suddenly it'll get a lot of different forks. Like everyone wants to watch it or use it. So I think um, a lot of people have the opinion that GitHub is really just for professional projects or whatever else, which is completely wrong. Um, I think a lot of the, the developers, mm -hmm. probably even in this Hangout, have folders on their hard drives that they perceive as not valuable or have game things that aren't really, you know, something that they think other people would benefit from. And I completely can guarantee you that's wrong. If you were to take a lot of that, put each one of those slightly organized, you know, just all you do is upload it to GitHub and say, this is something I created for jumping or this is something I created for dealing with, you know, A star algorithms, right? So, but, but is it yeah, public so if then you if you put it if on you GitHub? Wanna, can everybody? Um, if you don't want to pay, right? GitHub is completely free and it's completely open source and everything else. That's really the only rule is that what you publish has to be open source. If you do that, it's free. Um, if you mm. want to do collaboration, you can definitely do. Um, uh, you can create a project that does not allow anybody else to actually push to your repo. They still can fork it, and create their own version, but you're the one who can control who gets to commit, actually put code in your stuff, right? Um, if you want to pay, like, I think it's seven bucks a month. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is in euros and Deutschmarks and pounds, but it's it's cheap, right? If you um, if you put that put that up there, you can mm -hmm. make those repos private. So GitHub is responsible for maintaining the code, for backing up the code, and everything else. And you can collaborate in a safe environment, which is you know nice if you want to do a collaborative project with other people that has issue tracking and it has documentation, you can see the code, you can actually see from our perspective who committed what and when, and what did they add and what did they change, right? And all the actual branches that you make emerge, like all that's on GitHub. Bit, Bitbucket's a little um, cheaper, but uh, GitHub is just you know popular because it was first, right? It was one of the first collaborative web, here's my code, you know, here's all my libraries, and you know projects like that, right? Even NASA's got stuff up here. So I, I, I just found GitHub was, was helpful mm -hmm. for me working with the team because it has the issues built in. And if they do you know check code in, I can quickly check it out. Um, some people like to use command line. I like to use Tower. Um, if you go to, I think, github.com, they actually have a client for Mac and PC. But I just use Tower simply because it's you know it's simple right for a Mac. Um, the challenge I've had with GitHub is that most people who use GitHub are programmers, right? So they, they, they upload things called code. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm text um, as an artist you know when I'm dealing with sounds or images I'll have PSDs that are 100 megs I'll have you know multiple audio files that can be up to a gig I'll have lots of video right and so it's been very challenging to make folders 
that are just raw production assets that I don't actually have to check into GitHub, right? And that's, that's been the challenge is that if my computer were to fry, a lot of times I'd be without these raw you know, assets, the original image, the original artwork, things like that. So that's been the, the big challenge is, is even on a broadband connection, what do I check in to GitHub for the game, right? And what do I not? And I haven't really figured it out yet. Because um, I know, like you, you can use Git without having an internet. You can just, you know, check in locally. But that's not the point. The point is, if your computer breaks or whatever mm -hmm. else, you know, you can go to another computer and immediately work on your game because all your assets are in there. That's okay for applications, but that isn't very realistic for games, right? Because some of the games have a significant amount of assets in there. So I haven't, I haven't really figured that out yet. Um, but from a collaboration perspective, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. using Trello for all the issues. And then using GitHub for all the, the, the actual tracking of the code has been, for me, insanely helpful. Um, so I guess the only other thing I've been using a lot is Evernote. Um, I, I basically run a, a small software business, so I have, you know, a lot of clients, right? And it's been very challenging for me to keep track of, mm -hmm. of what client needs what when and what subcontractor I owe money to when and what project did they work on and what's left and what does a project manager do. From a gaming perspective, it's nice because if I'm not at the house, and I mean, I know some of the people on um, Google Plus talked about how do you deal with doing games in your spare time when you have kids, right? And so if you have young kids, like you don't have spare time, you don't sleep, you know, there is no, there is no, like, you know, a lot of these teenagers, I feel so bad for them because okay. they, they work so hard trying to learn gaming, you know, they, they really have good attitudes, good ideas, and they don't realize they have so much free time, right? So Evernote's been really nice because while I'm at the house, mm -hmm. I could be in the drive through you know, of Chick-fil-A. I can open my phone and see all my gaming notes or, you know, algorithms that I put in for Final Fantasy VI or whatever else. And it doesn't matter what device I'm on, I can see my notes mm -hmm. and I can keep track of, you know, what ideas I had and things like that. So Evernote's been really nice just from, right, it's right. not really good from a collaboration standpoint. They've started to build that in. But if you're ever concerned about, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to take my notes into GitHub, you know, Evernote's the next best thing because it's all in the cloud and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter, right? You can put pictures in here and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so things like that, which is, it's just, you know, one extra tool in your tool set, basically. Um, so that's it for collaboration. Right, right. Um, I can show some of the assets mm -hmm. if that helps. I'm not sure. I was. No, I'm. I'm also using um, Evernote, which is very nice because you have all these kind of um, uh, notebooks that you can even organize in different layers and stuff like that. And uh, can just uh, you have these all these web clipper tools that you can use in browser, so it's very fast to to build up a library of things that might be interesting. Um, but um, like you say, the problem is it's not really a collaboration tool. And um, what I'm trying out now is uh, because now uh, Google Drive has the ability to uh, stack um, uh, folders. You, you can put folders into folders and stuff like that, so you can really nicely organize your stuff and openly share um, documents. You can write together on documents. You can you have different kinds of, uh, for example, I have an add-on uh, for my Google Chrome browser where I can just send pictures directly from a web page to uh, Google Drive and stuff like that. And you have five gigabytes of, of um, uh, online storage. So uh, you can basically um, organize all the stuff you need. And everybody who has Google also has Google Documents, which makes it very easy from... Um, the team workflow perspective because they know what you um, how the thing works and you can even share the things that you see live with them and work on them with them and stuff like that and even pull them into hangouts so it's it's a very nice tool and it's it's a bit similar I think uh, to Evernote even with the search and stuff like that and it, it even has a, a gallery function which is very nice compared to what you have in Evernote where you would need to make uh, one note per picture to see it in a gallery, while in, um, uh, in, 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 in Google Drive you can have it like in Picasa, for example. So it's kind of a um, grid with all the yeah, pictures. We use Google Docs yeah. a lot for the business, but I haven't, I've only used it once for gaming. Most, um, most of the stuff I write about mechanics and stuff, mm -hmm. like, it's just easier to send like a, a one, you know, tweet or talk on the phone or, or an instant message. Like I, I once wrote, you know, they talk about the gaming document, right? It's like you take all your ideas, unless it's actually written in the document, mm -hmm. it's not really real and you can't really commit to it, right? What is that mechanic? What is that valid thing we're going to execute? 
and every time I write it, they're like, TLDR. Like, just send me a tweet. And I'm like, okay. So I've, it's been really great for collaboration for business stuff, but I haven't figured it out for games yet. At least, at least for Word docs. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Is um do you use or is anybody using any mind mapping tools or something like Prezi or stuff where you can have kind of bubbles or images and connect them with each other with lines or stuff like that? So you have a because the thing with Google Documents and Evernote is that you can um, create all these kind of notes and documents, but you can't really link them in any. Um, useful way where you say, okay, this is connected to that because it's kind of, I don't know, interacts with that or is meaningful for the other character or um, the main character has a feature like, for example, um, he can jump but his sidekick cannot jump but the sidekick is small so he can go underneath stuff. Uh, so we have kind of an interaction but if you have two documents for, for both, one for the sidekick, one for this uh, for the hero, you can't really connect them in any way. And so if you have a mind map or any other, other tool that um, is more visual in that sense, might help to organize. Did, you, did anyone try stuff like that? I use my iPad <laughs> and write everything awesome. in there and keep all the notes. Uh, you know, yeah. that that's not going to work for everybody, but I mean, that, that works for me just because so much of my stuff, but I can mix, you know, the drawing and, and the notes and the writing and all that and use different colors for different things. I and, see. you know, you got to get a good stylus, of course, but th that's worked for me pretty well so far. I've looked at a lot of the mind mapping stuff, but the problem I run into is every time I want to do something with it, it's like, oh, well, I want to draw a picture here. And there's probably software out there to do it, but like everybody else doing full-time freelance and game development and two small children. It's like, I don't have time to sink, you know, 80 hours into learning how to use this really awesome mind map software. That'd probably what be really awesome if I took time to learn it. But... Right, right. Uh, note, shelf note shelf for the iPad. Mm -hmm. And I've got massive amounts. <laughs> this is like one set of notebooks. And I go back... Yeah, I've got m tons and tons and tons and tons of pages... Uh, and tons of notebooks, and what I like is, you know, you can go through, create new notebooks, and so I start with one thing, and you can actually nowadays um, copy and paste from one page to another, and so like this morning before the kids were up, I sat down and wrote out a bunch of ideas, and then moved each of those to their own separate page, and made a title for that, and you mm -hmm. know, and so and then duplicated those pages, and now I've got the, okay, here's the next for April and May, and then here's for uh, later ideas, and so that's what I actually used for a lot of my kind of organization and, and keeping up with different projects and stuff. It works well for me. Mm -hmm. so I, I'll say I'll second that one. I, I use that a lot too. Uh, although without a stylus, finger only. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> and it, it, can you cloud sync it somehow? Does it go to Dropbox or is it just on the iPad? You can do a, uh, several different things. You can export as PDF, which is nice. I, I do that uh, for my artists sometimes and say, hey, this is kind of what I'm thinking for these things. Mm -hmm. um, you can also export stuff to Dropbox. If you hook it up to your Mac, I guess, or your PC through iTunes, you can export the SQLite file, which basically contains everything and all the notebooks, so you can back it up that way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got a lot of features. It's a, I've used a lot of the different drawing and writing um, apps for the iPad, and this is the one that I really, really like. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's yeah, kind of this. This reminds me of sorry. This reminds me of something uh, which is interesting for Google Drive, um, which I don't know if Evernote can do that. Uh, I have found in Google Drive you can say for a folder or for all your files if you want export them on your, on my hard drive in this and this format and then you have all the files. So if you have like 150 pictures of robots or something that you need for a project and they're just on Google Drive but you need them on something else, you just click the folder, export it and you have the whole thing um, uh, on your hard disk with the files. It's really nice. I, I don't know if you can do that with Evernote or with any other app. And um, it's kind of the, the main thing is that these kind of the, the openness of, of the tool that you use to, to import, export stuff right. and to uh, kind of, I mean, for example, if, if, you make a, if you make a drawing of something, how it would work, and then you want to put that in, let's say, Illustrator or Photoshop to do something with it and then put it back 
uh, into the other program. It's um, kind of these are the kind of things where I think um, it's it's it would be nice to have something where you can be more interactive as, as tools. Where where can they connect to each other um, uh, with the in, inside of the workflow inside of the not to lose track of your uh, of the of the of your creativity or stuff. So. Yeah, I always take, I always take I pictures asking. of my, yeah. my Sorry, what, what? drawings and I'll import them into Flash that way. And it's a pretty pathetic workflow. It'd be nice if there was something that I, I could just immediately transfer it. I mean, <laughs> my, my iPhone takes reasonable resolution, but it kind of loses the fidelity of the text because I have horrible handwriting, right? And a lot of times I want to edit, you know, the notes that I had originally, like you were saying, the mind map, right? You, you've connected all the characters, all the abilities, all the stuff, and you want to bring it to something that's more digital. And, right. Uh, It'd be nice if the iPad had something that was a little easier to integrate with that. Maybe I should just start drawing on the iPad to hell with paper. Yeah. But, I mean, like, uh, what is your name? I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, Greg. Like, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> like Greg said, uh, if you have a good stylus, it's really amazing to draw on uh, on the iPad. And um, you can always uh, just take the picture and send it to Evernote or to Dropbox or whatever. Uh, from Mostly from inside the app, uh, often apps have that. Like Sketchbook Pro, you can mail it and drop it and send it uh, to all different kinds of applications. So that's very nice. And um, at the same time, it's um, for stuff like Sketchbook Pro, um, you you um, have inside of the app the different kind of layers and stuff, so you can st st still change it. It's not a finished finished picture. That's very nice. I think you can even uh, Sketchbook Pro even has the the ability to export a PSD, so you keep the layers even if you export it to another program. That's that's pretty nice. One other thing you can do, you can also import pictures and then mark them up and things like that. Um, it doesn't ah. Note Shelf doesn't have a lot of layers, but this is just an example I did for a friend of mine. You know, so I imported a, a screenshot of his website and started drawing on it. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's it's pretty cool. You know, if you've got an iPad, it's worth checking out. Get a good stylus. I like the Alupin. They're about twenty five bucks, but it's a big hefty. It doesn't feel like you're writing with a pipe cleaner. Or Which an empty pen <laughs> like so many of the other ones. But it's called the Alu Pen, uh, A L U P E N. Um, like, are you uh, the what do you mean? Or do you actually have a connected stylus? Okay, got it. Yes. No, I'm actually drawing on the iPad itself with this. Mm -hmm. um, the tips do run out on these, so I end up buying a new one like every year, but, you know, for 25 bucks or whatever, it's a, it's a good pen to use. Where, where do you buy those in the, in mm -hmm. the States? Oh, Amazon. Make sure, <laughs> though, I'll tell you this. Make sure you get one from the company, which is called Just Mobile, because a buddy of mine ordered one, and he got, like, a knockoff that was looked similar, but it wasn't the right thing. The real one comes in a box and has a cool little leather-looking uh, sheath and stuff like that. It, it's high quality, and the thing I really like about it, it's got a little bit of heft, but it, it just flows really, really smoothly. Mm, cool. Oh. I might have to invest in one of those. Yeah, it, it's good. I've got notebooks with you know eighty and ninety pages and stuff, and this is what I use for oh. all my notes for my whole life, basically. I have one too. I don't. Ah, is it this one? No, it's not. Okay, because it was pretty cheap and it's kind of good. So, but I don't know where it is. <laughs> Can't tell you right now. Uh, anyways, maybe I'll find it later. All right, okay. So I, I have a question. Uh, if somebody, I mean, all y'all, I'm sure, mm -hmm. have folders and you're good at organizing folders. My issue has been about... <laughs> Not really. <laughs> They're all over the my place. My issue is I have yeah. a significant amount of game assets, and I don't know how to break them up between what is actually being worked on and what doesn't need to go in source control. So like for example, I always have like code, which is all the actual code for the game and it's for the actual uh, bin, kind of like you know what you're actually gonna deliver, whether it's the APK for the Android or the IPA, all the actual executable, whatever, right? But all your source code and everything else is usually what goes into GitHub. Um, the other stuff like audio, I mean, I'll have like multiple you know folders in there. I'll have like the raw assets I record from the microphone, I'll get you know, raw music I got from some artist, and then I'll have raw sound effects. Then I have to edit them, and then I have to master them, right? At what what point or where do those things go that are final? Usually I'll put the finals in code, but are you, are you guys like 
using two different directories? Are you guys, you know, keeping every single asset in your source control? Like, how are you handling? And I mean, the same goes for design too. How are you handling the raw design assets versus the production design assets? Like, where do you put those things? And I guess it'd be nice to see how somebody else does it. Mm -mm. I know I uh, usually end up. I use Unity for pretty much everything these days, and so the nice thing about that is you can actually drop a PSD right in there or your original Cinema 4D or Blender file and just deal with it directly uh, from within Unity. And if I need to change something, I can double-click it in Unity. It, it opens up the Photoshop file, turn layers on, off, or, or whatever, and save it out in Unity updates. Um, so I end up working with a lot of the, the final assets in the project folder, which I then upload all of that well, to Bitbucket. Well, how do you do with version control? Then? Um, if you're uploading a binary yeah. Unity file and you've made changes on your PSD, how do you know like the differences? How does that work? Um, within Unity, one of the things that I use kind of for, and I, I use a lot of different methods. I archive all my stuff into zips um, every once in a while, the whole folder and throw that into SugarSync, which is basically like Dropbox but a little less expensive. And that so that syncs up against my PC and my Mac. I also use uh, Unity's uh, asset server to move stuff back and forth between the PC and the Mac so I can keep a web build and an iOS build running at the same time. Um, I also with certain projects upload stuff to Bitbucket. Um, and you know and you can do the ignores and stuff with Git um, to exclude you know, like I had one project, they literally wanted 20 minutes of video in their iPad, which brought the project, it was like 2.3 gigs. I'm like, I don't even think the asset store will take this. And if it does, you'll be in the top 10 all-time biggest apps. And they, they finally relented. Um, and so, yeah, but I mean, but the big thing in Unity, though, is I end up using different scenes and, and then kind of organize that within. And so I have, like, different test scenes that I use and then final scenes and... Um, you know, and I, I uh, put a suffix of underscore SCN on each one, so within Unity I can go and search SCN, and it pulls up all my scenes. Um, and so I, I, I kind of do a lot of different ways. You know, when I end up um, working with the artist, uh, we collaborate with Dropbox, and I'll put the files over there, and so that's where a lot of the originals sit. But then I'll also go and, you know, include those when I zip everything up. I, I like lots of redundancy. Well, it doesn't sound like you're really worried too so much that, about the history you know, of the actual raw assets. You're more interested in actually the code and the implementation. Is that true? <laughs> and maybe that's because I'm a programmer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I, I do keep lots of layered PSDs, and, and, and I also, well, no, I guess, it, yeah, I do actually do that. What I do there is I just rename the files. Final. And so, like if you look at one of my Cinema 4D directories, Oh, no, um, more like, you know, uh, for a game I made about running over clowns, and it was here's the city, and here, un city underscore zero one all the way, I think my last one was like 24B. What, what is it, the you B know, represent? So I do A, B, C, D if it's... Got it. Those are minor tweaks to that that I may or may not end up keeping, and then once I make significant changes, <laughs> the then B I'll make is it not underscore 25. Off, right? Like there's no mention of what the B is, it's just... Well, if that's the if that ends up being the current one that I use, then I copy that over to Unity, and so the, the final right. asset for that city block is you know, uh, Sparky City twenty four B, but next time it might be Sparky Rick City you know thirty one or whatever. <laughs> and uh. so then I can always go back you know to my other directories and go okay I'm looking for thirty one or or whatever. Hmm. Yeah, it, it it works for me. I mean, I, I've been doing programming a long time, and so a lot of this stuff kind of has kind of evolved from that. I don't know that it's the right way or the wrong way, but it it works pretty good for me. What um, what what I'm doing is because I'm also working with Unity, and it is a very uh, you have like this very nice um, ability to create folders inside the project that are real folders then on your hard disk, so you can organize it inside of the project pretty easily. Um, the, uh, what I do, though, is um, I work to a certain point, and when I think, okay, now it's time to make a backup, actually, I just copy uh, the folder of the... I, I close Unity, copy the project of the, 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 the project folder with everything in it, and mm -hmm. rename it just uh, version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 
and um, then I restart Unity and uh, route it to this new um, directory. And the nice thing now is uh, I have a backup, so if anything goes wrong, I don't have to worry about it. But the other nice thing is I can delete all the stuff that I thought in the last version was kind of interesting to test out, to try out different kind of sound files or visuals or effects that didn't really work out, didn't really seem to be good in the game. And I can just delete so them and leave, leave just yeah, the see, things I that I need. Get so. Them. Deleting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's getting absolutely, yeah. And um, then I um, the the structure that I mostly have is that I make a uh, one folder for the game. Inside of that folder are the different versions of the game development. Then I have folders uh, that uh, a folder that has the original files, like original sound files, PSD files, and stuff like that, uh, that they don't need to have inside of the Unity. Uh, because I think if it's too much, maybe it's getting slower. Also, I found out that uh, Unity is not converting sound automatically and stuff like that. So the project is blown up like 10 times the size if you don't make it Okwobis or stuff like that. And um, also to have uh, to have a better reach if you, if I need to to edit some kind of file in the project or some kind of original file where I where I have it and uh, they, they can get pretty big if you have a lot of layers of different versions of stuff so that is kind of in, uh, interesting uh, to 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 have it outside of the Unity project also for the copies uh, that you make for the backups because if it gets like five gigabytes and you have ten copies like then it's a pretty pretty big space on your um, hard disk. And um, uh, one more thing that I have is um, I always have a sandbox folder uh, which I use to make the builds in. So if I try something, does it work? Does it run in the same speed or version or way in my browser or on the computer, stuff like that? I export it to the sandbox folder uh, so I know it's inside of there and doesn't spread anywhere else so I don't get confused. Because before that I just made a build on the desktop and then another one, another one, and then you completely lose track of what is going on and what was the last one. Final, 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 and final, 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 final. If you have something, absolutely, yeah. And if you have something in the sandbox that you think, oh, this is interesting, you just export one level or one part that you want to see and this works in a certain way, you can just copy that to another folder where you say, okay, this is interesting, and make another build and export that into the sandbox to compare them. So it's kind of, you can organize these kind of test builds pretty, pretty good that way. And uh, also with Unity, you can. It's pretty nice that you don't have to export the whole game. You can say just, "I want to have this scene." And often, a scene is not just a level in the game. It can be anything like a menu or something. And you just export the the configuration menu for the sound or something and test it in the browser without the rest of the game. So that's pretty nice to to um, have this ability inside of the. Well, it seems yeah. like Unity and Flash, like it's those kind work of my really folder well too, because you have everything packaged. But like all this web stuff and all, even even with mm. Corona, it's been very difficult because you don't have this binary repository of stuff. Like you have all your design assets and your deployment directory is the same thing, just optimized. So there's files everywhere. So it's been challenging to yeah. go back in time where you didn't have everything. So maybe I should just switch to Unity and stop whining. It that's uh, that's <laughs> that is I think one point is for me uh, for tools uh, that I want to use for organization that um, uh, they have to be able to do what I want from them, but at the same time have to be as simple as humanly possible because otherwise they just waste my time and I just get confused and it just gets in the way of my workflow and. Um, I think Unity was the tool that I found was um, at the same time extremely simple but still um, a kind of acknowledged by the, the game developers. So there is other tools who are more simple but they are seen like kids toys so nobody takes you seriously if you make games in them and the other ones are really very complicated so um, it's kind of not the stuff that I would like to learn and the cool thing is with the, with the asset store and all the things you can inputs uh, you can uh, put uh, as add-ons into um, Unity, uh, you can bring it down to a very simple level. But like uh, le le lately I um, started to use Playmaker and it's it's visual coding basically. So you have just text box and you have, you have a, um, a search that gives you all the different functions you can do and you just click on them and uh, the function comes into the box and you just enter the values what you want to do and um, 
This is so fast and so simple and you can even use it for the finished game that it's very, very easy to try out things that before I had to search for hours on the on the forums of, of Unity. How do I do this if I want to create that and why doesn't it work? And then you have this visual coding and um, you just put them together, you connect the lines and you see, oh, okay, that works some, somehow interesting. Maybe I do it a little bit different. And if I really want to have the smoothness and fastness of a real code, then I can code it afterwards if I really have to. But often I really don't have to. So that's very nice. And to build stuff like achievements or le uh, these kind of um, uh, uh, menus and stuff that you need that are kind of time intense if, if you just want to build them uh, for your game, you, you can do them really, really fast because you just have to connect and copy past stuff. Uh, for especially for achievements, different different level, uh, sorry, uh, weapon upgrades or stuff like that. You just copy, pass, exchange the values. That's it, and you have a new weapon. So that's really nice, really nice tool. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's good, man. I, I definitely got to check out Unity. I know a lot of people that basically abandoned Flash stuff for Unity. You know, feel really comfortable. It has a lot of the same concepts, the yeah. exact same creative workflow in terms of tooling, even if you're not doing 3D stuff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's free anyway, so it just just try it out. Look, if you make web games or stuff, it's free. So yeah. An hour a day. What do I do with that hour? Yeah. Sure. Oh, by the way, I I've seen your video about the workflow, and um, you have all these amazing tools. Um, did I mean, maybe not the best question to ask on a Hangout, but how can you afford all these things, or are they I just, just I, copied no, from, just, the, from the web or something? So I, you know, I do software during the day, and um, a lot of it's ah, okay, so sort it's of. Like, same I don't, tools I don't get paid work. to use Reason. I don't get paid to use After Effects. I don't get paid to use, you know, whatever. But in the States, um, you can basically buy things for your business, right, software, hardware, whatever, and it's a tax write-off, right? So basically the government's not going to mm, require okay. me to pay taxes on a $5,000 master collection, right? That actually reduces my taxable income. So it benefits me to A, buy it for work, and then C, I, I actually – it helps my end-of-the-year taxes a little bit, right? Additionally, um, you know, some of those things like mm. posting those videos, even if I don't actually get to use After Effects, people will see that – Oh, you seem like creative. You, you don't seem like the, a programmer who just does code all day. Maybe you can help with my project, right? So that kind of stuff helps. So it's it's more of like a, an advertising budget, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, additionally, like consulting, mm -hmm. you know, tends to pay enough where you package in. I need to make X per year so I can afford the software, right? I need to be able to afford a Mac to do my job. So every year, I kind of just say, all right, what's the budget for my year, and what software do I want? And uh, so far, Maya and Unity haven't made it into that, but maybe they should. <laughs> maybe they, they should. <laughs> I think the, the real flow is, yeah, yeah. I've been, I mean, I know it's not really for games, but after seeing Portal 2 and some of the things they've been doing, that real flow plugin for, it's either cinema or whatever, it does all the liquids, that, uh, that has some really cool effects. I've been trying to emulate that stuff in Box 2D pretty pathetically. So, but from an inspiration perspective, it's just, uh -huh, uh -huh. I don't know, it's pretty amazing. So, again, one hour a day. Real flow is a, is a beast. Yeah, you don't, you don't want to try to learn real flow on one hour a day, man. <laughs> I've, I've worked with it. It's amazing, but it's a beast. Now, blender fluids are not bad. Blender fluids have gotten a lot better if you want to play with some fluid stuff that's not going to require massive amounts of time uh, to invest just to How much that get started. Time? Real flow you know what I mean? will. That's been my issue is like I need another computer for uh, a lot of the stuff. Right. Uh, with Blender, with especially with the newer versions, uh, I don't, I'm not sure about the Mac. The Mac still has some issues with that, but on the PC side, if you've got a, a good NVIDIA card, you can uh, do GPU rendering and get past a lot of it, but with all of the fluid simulation stuff, and this also applies to smoke and sometimes fire, um, you're looking at a lot of simulation time over and over and over and over right, and so over. Because, oh, that didn't so. work right. Oh, these right. particles yeah. flew out there. Yeah, and then you got to start the whole thing Facebook over again. And that's not even yeah, rendering. Work, like five Do what? To share After Effects. Does that work with smoke and fire too? or? Yes, for the rendering, for the most part. No, I don't think for the for the simulation. So for the particle simulation, it's not fast enough 
or inaccurate because different ones will process it in different ways, although I think they've gotten past most of that. So that usually has to be done on one beast of a computer, and so you end up with like a 16-core multi-thread to do uh, the particle simulation, which can run for days, depending on how detailed you want to be. And then you get to render it. Like that, that's, that was a great thing about Love yeah. 2D. Like, yeah. Real flow is neat. Three lines but... of Lua code, you have a particle system. It's like, yay. And everyone's like, yeah, but, you know, my is 3D, blah, 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 so much better. And I'm like, I'm done. You're not. Peace out. You know? so. <laughs> Maya's, Maya's kind of a beast. I mean, it's gotten a lot better lately. I do a lot of stuff with 3D. I am a programmer, but I've also been doing 3D stuff for, for quite a few years from a technical point. Um uh, I don't know that it, I would suggest Maya as anyone's first package. There's there's a lot of other good stuff out there these days, like Cinema and even Blender um, has really grown in the yeah, last, last four or five years. Yeah, that's the last time I looked at all that stuff was just right mm, after you know, working with the agencies. They had all these 3D guys doing stuff with After Effects. And, you know, at the end of the day, you could see some of the more creative things yeah. they were doing. It's like, I, why did I choose programming as a career? Oh, my God, it's so cool. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap there, especially if you look at like Cinema 4D and some of the MoGraph and and motion graphics stuff, and and um, you know, of course, they just announced a big partnership. But also check out Video Copilot in his um, uh, plugin. I can't remember the name of it right now, but he's basically got a plugin where that they do the rendering inside of uh, After Effects. I think it's called Element 3D. Yeah, VideoCopilot.net. He's got some really amazing real time stuff. But yeah, you'd be surprised how much overlap there is for technical people to do 3D stuff, and there's rigging and all that stuff too. But I'm getting way off topic for this. So. <laughs> we'll, we'll chat another that was, time. That was helpful, though. Thank you very much. Uh, there's there's one thing I have with organization, which is really complicated for me, is uh, naming of things like variables or game objects or different kind of materials and assets and stuff like that, and. It's it, it gets so quickly out of hand for me, and I really don't know how to control that. So, for example, you have uh, like you have a name for something, and it's like a player gun one bullet one effect zero one B, and then you have a list of all the different other things. So the name is like this long uh, to describe where this asset fits and why and uh, how it is used. Uh, to to describe it in the name and not get confused afterwards. We say, oh, this is bill, bullet number five hundred sixty. <laughs> what, what is it for? So I, I put it in the name, but I'm kind of getting confused. Even also with the variables where you kind of use very much of in 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 in, in, in scripts, and I'm always kind of Ugh, how do I name them? And especially if you don't want to write all the words, you know, you don't want to write enemy. You have to cut it down to to just n or something like that. So. You have too you, many bullets. You never have enough bullets. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not just about the bullets, but it's kind of uh, d different things that you have on a character and maybe different versions and stuff like that. I know like that, that. We never, so, we never... And it gets very complicated. I've never seen abbreviation help anybody. Yeah. Like I've seen like a lot of the Lua guys, the biggest frustration yeah. I had, you know, getting the Lua, I came from ActionScript. And when Flash died, I grabbed onto the Lua life, lifeboat, and I'm like, all right, let's try this stuff. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's great. It's functional, and you can make a function that's really small and tight. And, oh, by the way, the functions are three letters. And I'm like, so I'm young and mature. Okay? I get like what? I've been in this industry for a while, but everyone I know who's any good has talked about verbosity. If you have to think when you read code, you already have a problem, right? You should be able to – if the function's like 24 words long – that's wonderful because you don't have to think about what it is. You have to read it, right? Anytime anybody's tried to abbreviate to compensate mm -hmm. for large code bases or large amounts of assets, I've never seen that help. Um, the other frustrating thing is tooling. Like in ActionScript or Java, you know, we have wonderful tools that can help refactor things. So if we want to organize them into folders or packages, we can do that, right? With Lua, like mm -hmm. one of my, my challenges was to keep my packages one level deep. So I could find code because as soon as I had like five folders and I wanted to move something, it's like Ruby and Python. It's all functional. Yeah. It's all magic. You get no help from compilers, no help from tooling. And it's like, okay, so I have to abbreviate at least in my package structure. And uh, I haven't found a solution for that either. And I think that really relies on tooling, not on us. That's my opinion. Just because anytime you abbreviate it, you just make it harder for yourself to understand. Like, like you're saying, bullet 5001, what is it for? Well, if you write it out, you know. You might have like long name bullets, but at least you have a fighting chance to understand, yeah. right? So 
I don't know. I struggle with the same thing. I think who is that dude? Newth or whatever that computer scientist. He's like some of the hardest things in computer science is coming up with var variable names. Like you know, solving algorithms is one thing, but actually, mm -hmm. like, what is the name of that variable? I don't know. Like that'll keep you up. Yeah. So yeah, that was not an answer. That was I agree. It's painful. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Just name I'm everything just temp. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the good thing right now for me is that the games are pretty small and easy, so I don't really have much assets. <laughs> Um, but if you make something bigger and you, let's say you a have 15 different enemy awesome. types. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, not, not 5,000 bullets, but if, if you say you have 15 different enemy types, so um, you have to say that all they have different textures and sound effects and effects on them and they shoot bullets and have different kind of animations or stuff like that. And you have to name them all in a way that you know this is kind of, I don't know, the glow effect for the second weapon for the third character that he's holding in the left hand or something like that. So the name is really getting long. And I understand it's a pretty good idea to, to put all of that into the name. Um, but if then, I mean, you have to have a full screen folder that you Get just can read display. all the, 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 the fi file names, you know? I'm from the south. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> a 42-inch display. <laughs> Come on, dude. I'm not even doing yeah, anything. Yeah, I can, right, I can, right. Like, you know, I can't survive right. something small. So clearly, you need to upgrade, bro. Uh, uh. So that's kind of, I don't know. I have to figure it out somehow. How, how to figure it out. That. Post it on Google+. Plus. Uh. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah. I, the, maybe another thing is um, what I find complicated because um, lately I try before I start to code or make anything in the game that I really try to write down and figure out um, what the game should be about and what should be in the game. Of course, then it changes pretty much pretty fast uh, when, you, when you start to do it because you realize, okay, some things are fun, others are not, or they don't even work or stuff like that. Um, but uh, to, to have this kind of written down and have an idea of how things work, why they work, how they co incorporate with each other, what effects what and stuff like that, it's, um, it also gets very complicated pretty fast to, to see um, to, if one character does something that affects something in another character. Uh, for example, um, you, you have the character and the, 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 um, of course he has a weapon and the weapon has a strength. So the strength is affecting the health if you hit the enemy. And with this um, you have also, you lower the mana of the, uh, or the hit power that the, the player has with the weapon so you can't hit all the time. And on the, on the enemy side um, you have to calculate how this is affecting the health and the, uh, the armor and stuff like that. And you have like a million lines on your, on your, um, uh, 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 on your on your mind map, and uh, this is uh, often if you have all the features that you have for one character, and if even it's a simple character, it's like a big cloud of of, of different things that the character has, and then they have to be connected to the other things and how they interact in the game, and I'm I'm really not sure how to control that or how to 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 know what is what and where it's happening and why. And uh, this is even getting more complicated if you work on a project for a longer time or you make a break in the, co in the project, say, okay, I leave this for some months and then I come back uh, to, to have a more of a distance to it. And then to realize what is affecting what and why and how can I have an overview of the project. I, I have no they, idea they, how to do that. They've done a study, I think, it's really, two it's years ago, three years ago, where they found that yeah, to-dos yeah. are not very effective in reminding yourself like what to do so like you might put a slash slash to do on this particular date and so you look a search for to do in your code mm -hmm. and then you sort by the date of the to do right they found that that's actually not very effective for most programmers to know some programmers will actually break the code because they're so tired and they'll just break it on purpose and mm -hmm. they're like i'm gonna finish this tomorrow man so like make it not compile so when they come back like a week later <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay. So I've done so, that. Because he gets so mad. Because like, look, dude, it's 2 a.m. My brain isn't working. Forget about it. I'll change it. So they come back a week later, and the compiler helps. And sometimes they're like, why was I an idiot and I broke the code? I don't understand what I was thinking. What could possibly be wrong with this, right? So that's also not very effective either. It's more effective than the to-dos. 
Right, right, right. So oh, you have to comment. To do is because you don't have to look, and most tooling, you know, will tell you where the error is, whether mm -hmm. runtime or compile time. But unless you give yourself context, which is very hard to do when you're a programmer and you're in the middle of something, right? The other issue is the cognitive load, right? Mm -hmm. No one, no one ever, like managers don't understand this, but you have to load, like you just said, all those aspects in your head of how a character works. Once you're ready, it takes 40 minutes for you to do that, right? It's on, on average 40 minutes for a developer to actually load that in your head. Mm -hmm. So if you break the code and you have it to do and mm -hmm. you have an understanding of how it's supposed to work, then you have a fighting chance of continuing where you left off, assuming you understand the code. And it's, they, they, mm -hmm. they found that there's really no good effective way to actually do that yet, and that is where programmers leave off, right, on, on what it is. And so that, again, this all assumes the code works, it's, mm -hmm, readable, mm -hmm. it's well architected, and those are not often mm -hmm. not the case, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Especially if you're trying to do quick iteration to see if it's fun or mm -hmm. real. So, again, not an answer, just confirming you're not crazy. <laughs> like, they, uh, the, the actual scientific studies. Yeah, 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 I see. I mean, there's I not see. many in programming, which sucks, right? But it proves that it's, it's very, very difficult. So, mm -hmm. so far, the only thing that seemed to work is a to-do, a break, and some form of the best encapsulation you can possibly do so you don't have to think, right? Which is not, it's like a 13% mm, effect. I see. Which is pathetic. Yeah, but I mean that there has to be some way how to organize that. Like, for example, if you take World of Warcraft, which I think is one of the most um, amazingly integrated worlds where you have all these kind of different cultures and creatures and things and they blend into each other but you don't feel alienated if you go to another area and there is oh, some no. suddenly you are in an they, area that okay. looks sci-fi you know so they make that's kind of hours a day for doing nothing yeah, no, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. But they uh, they may have a lot of money and a lot of people working on that. But if you have, let's say, the team is like 300 people, and one is working on the Pandare and the other one is working on I don't know the names of all the creatures, um, to to blend that to say, okay, this has to be this has to work with each other, and you can find something here but not there, and they have this feature so the others can't have that feature and stuff like that. You have to have some kind of organization where you say, okay, this and this is happening, and it, you also have all these quests and stuff. Of course, this is a, a, a much larger dimension than we work in, um, but if I think about my, my simple, small games, um, and I change a little bit in the game, and then I have to think, wow, uh, what does this affect everywhere in the game? So I have to go to all the places, look at them, see if it still works, if it kind of is still fun, balance it again and stuff like that. If I remember if that, this has had an effect on that at all or not. So this is kind of, there has to be some way to organize that and to say, okay, if you do that, this and this and this and this is all affected by that. And I don't, I don't know how to do that, especially if you work in a team and you say the, to, to someone, okay, you have to build this in that way because it affects this and this and that, and they have to understand why, because you can't just write something or develop something if you don't know how it integrates in the world, or otherwise it's just, just a piece. I, I think it's, it's like that. I'm not sure. I don't think there's an easy way to do it. I think you just have to do it. You know, uh, Richard Garriott, Lord British, uh, in his Lord recent British. thing that everybody you know got fired up about, about all game design, you know, all game designers suck. You know, he talked about in all the Ultimate games, he had binders and binders of information about the different towns and where stuff was and how it all fit together. You know, and I mean, and I, I don't, I don't have that kind of discipline or time. Um, but I think if you're going to make something like that that's going to be that well balanced and spread out, especially if you're going to have other people working on it, mm -hmm. I, I don't see how you can get away with not doing that because of, you know, I mean, I, I feel certain that, you know, somewhere at Blizzard there are big, you know, bookshelves of stuff. I mean, like uh, character animation, you know, they, they make style sheets for the different characters that show, you know, you can find all kinds of Disney characters and stuff. And it shows this is what the character looks like from every angle. This is why Mickey looks this way. You know, Mickey Mouse, if he's looking right at you, he's got ears here. If he turns to the side, it's like this. Well, you know, and somebody had to sit down and say, these are the rules. This is how the character right, looks right, when right. he bends. And this is how he looks when he jumps and everything. And you can, you know, you go type character design sheets and you mm -hmm. can find this for everything in animation. I, I think we just have to figure out 
what that looks like for us. And I don't know that there is a good way. Google Docs, mm -hmm. you know, with the highlighting and stuff like that. Right. Um, By the way, this remembers me of something. Um, there is a service which was invented in, in Germany. It's called Kobo Cards. And oh, or Kobo cards, I don't know the English uh, pronunciation. And this is like these normal learning cards, like uh, these these things in a box, you know, that you use to learn flash languages cards. and stuff like that. Flashcards, yeah, yeah. yeah, flashcards. And the the interesting thing is they found that uh, software companies are using their cards. And if a developer a developer is writing some new code or new functions or stuff like that, uh, he has at the same time to write it on the card and explain how it works. So if a new um, worker comes, a new coder or a new graphic designer or something comes, uh, they give him this set of cards that is defined for his job, his, his position, and he has like one or two weeks just to learn the cards and then he can start start to work. So that's that's kind of maybe that's an interesting tool to to uh, to yeah yeah to come back to your project and, well, and still dude, know what it is about and how it works. Open source project yeah. I've seen not game but successful where it was an idea and it started to get momentum. Always had a core leader at the front who did not code. His responsibility was to say. Uh, yeah. you know, we need to he like the manager right he he'd say like look we're all have some great ideas you're really good at engine writing you're really good at graphics let's all start going this way and do it together and he'd line up everyone efficiently and you know he'd say like you realize you got no branding you got no mm -hmm. marketing well most coders are so down in the weeds they don't have time to you know come up for air and go you know no one even knows about my game. The last time I posted it was something was six months ago it's completely changed from them. So a lot of those people they spend full time jobs on right. just organizing the team and the code and then mm -hmm. they when they have a breather yeah. they climb the tree and go guys we really need to be going this way right like from a leadership perspective and it's, it's always been frustrating because most of the time when I'm working yeah. I always want to work with people like me who are passionate about coding but oftentimes I realize like wouldn't it be cool if I could just have mm -hmm. like 50 bucks you know an hour set aside for a week and I could bring this person in and say where was I what was I supposed to be working on and, and did I break the character right, mechanic right, because right. I did this? Right now, it's all on me, and it sucks. It'd be nice if I had somebody who could, you know, like, like those open source projects have, the manager who just does that organization. I know that would help me a lot because it helps me in software. So be mm -hmm. nice mm -hmm. games. I don't know if that's what gaming companies have, but it would certainly be nice to have. Yeah. yeah okay, so. There we go. I'm down yeah, right. That, right. That's, that's, a, that's a full-time game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I think you know one thing that I found is that that usually helps, even if they don't do code. If they, you know, if they are invested in some area, they know some area well, whether it's code or, um, you know, the art or something, you know. And then I, know, I bet you guys all get this all the time. Somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, I got a great idea for an app. I heard that you make apps." And you're like, "Whoa, you know." But if, if all <laughs> you're coming to me bucks. with is an idea, huh? and you're not gonna. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. Br bring a pile of cash, also, you know. But I mean, yeah, it helps, right. you know, because like on, you know, and and I guess if you come up with the idea and you kind of recruit some friends, and that's the way that I build my stuff, hmm. I end up kind of being that project manager, you know. And we sit and we, you know, let's kick around ideas, but somebody has to be the one who decides. Okay, this is the way we're gonna go. Okay. Uh, the car is going to do this, but not this. We're going to have these animations, but not those right now. And so I've kind of got you know the working list, and then here's the wish list. That was a great idea, but we'll work on it 2.0 or 3.0 or 5.0 or somewhere way down the road. Somebody's mm -hmm. got to be the one that makes that call with us. And if everything's just sitting in your head, you know, I found it's really good to get it in a spreadsheet or well, you sound a like a PM that, spreadsheet. Somebody sent me a game design document <laughs> that was a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I've done some of this stuff, I guess, and, and you know, but I end up kind of doing it on my own stuff, and so that it, when I do pull in other people, I'm like, all right, you know, let, let's have this. But I think you've got to have that. It, otherwise, you know, yeah, if you look at unsuccessful open source projects, it's because it didn't have a clear vision, um, you know, and even companies I worked at, you know, and it's like, yeah, I built, I spent three years building this custom CRM. But they wisely at the beginning said, all right, if nobody is going to enforce people using this, we're not going to waste the money to do it because people are lazy. That's our nature, you know, and that, that's mm. fine. But if somebody's not there kind of, you know, driving it on and pushing it forward, it's not likely to happen. Mm. Right, right, right. 
This is also, by the way, this is a good point. Uh, uh, what you remind me of something else. Uh, the 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 um, organization of time. Where you say uh, people get lazy, and I think for me one one of the main reasons why I get lazy or why I get sidetracked with some other stuff that I'm doing at that time is um, because I didn't. Um, how can I say? I I I I made it too loose. I just said, okay, I need to do this and this and this and that till that time, which is a deadline in two weeks or something like that. So it's completely open, and. Um, I found for me it really helps um, to be very conservative about that and just say, okay, today is Monday and, and Monday I do coding and I do sound effects and nothing else. And I do this on Monday and not just when I feel like it because this is there's also this kind of, oh yeah, but when, when I'm kissed by the muse, when I'm in the mood of being creative, then I can be creative. Right. Um, which is rubbish because uh, the the only thing you have to be is like productive, uh, and uh, so you can be creative if you if you say to yourself, this is the time where I just do this stuff, where I just do Blender or just do coding or just do sound effects or stuff like that, or writing uh, about a character, and you sit down and just do that for an hour, and you don't have to think about what I'm going to work on, why do I do, do have to do that stuff right now and um, what kind of specific things I need to do. And it's, it's so easy to get um, off, off track and say, oh, uh, this sound effect reminds me of this other character. I will just draw <laughs> yeah. some sketches of it. And then you remind, oh, yeah, this is interesting. I should write a little code about um, how this is moving or jumping and stuff like that. And suddenly the day is uh, away, and you haven't achieved anything because you just crumbled away on some little side right. things that have no importance. So. Um, I find for myself it's much better to say to myself, well, this is just an hour where you just do the sound effect of maybe the guns. Mm -hmm. And it's I, I always found for myself that if I say, well, the sound of this gun, I maybe take 15 minutes, I'm finished with that. It's never the case. So if you say, well, I take 15 minutes or take 20 minutes to make that sound, always take triple the time. So you say, okay, let's sit down one hour and make that because it always takes longer. And if you have the wrong imagination about well, how long it takes, it's it's always bad for um, the, the outcome of the thing. I, I found for myself. Because you get a kind of, okay, this has, it, I, it should already be f uh, finished and uh, you get kind of nervous and pressured from your own uh, wrong time estimate. So if you take more time than you need for it and you're, you're finished earlier with a thing that you're really happy with and uh, you knew that you just responsible for this one thing at this one time, it really helps uh, to not get off the project and not do anything else at that time. Yeah. So I, I really have to be very conservative in that kind, which I never wanted to be, because I always thought, well, this is stupid. Why why do you have a need a place for everything? Here are the scissors, and there is the coffee, and this is the table for writing, and this is the table for painting. But it really helps. I really found that it helps that I say, okay, here I do this, there I do that. On Monday I just make sound. On Tuesday I just make code, and nothing right. else. And it's kind sure. of it's very helpful for me. Yeah, I found that to be true as well. The, um, I know, you know, it, it's way more fun to just jump into a project and start coding and throwing assets around and attaching mm -hmm. scripts. I love doing that, and that's great for creative. But when I'm actually trying to make progress, or if it's important, or I've got, you know, a short deadline, I sit down and I make a list of stuff. This is what I've got to do. This is what I prioritize. And what one thing that I found um, is something that's um, it's called the Pomodoro technique that it's basically you um, spend you break your task down into 25 minute chunks and you work on one thing for 25 minutes and then you give yourself a five minute break I posted a link it's pomodorotechnique.com it's based on basically a tomato you know a kitchen tomato timer that's where the name of it came from and so you then you break down your tasks into I think this is going to take two pomodoros or basically two 25 minute sessions or this is going to take you know five you know basically half hour sessions and list out your tasks that way and then you work on it and then you can go through and say okay this actually took less than that or this took more than that um, mm -hmm. but it's a good way to really kind of hyper focus in on one thing and you think oh you know I've got a timer running I'm not gonna check my email right now I'm not gonna check Facebook I'm not gonna check Twitter I'm just gonna focus on this one thing and I've got this other thing oh and I'm gonna write that down real quick for later I'm gonna focus back on this I found it really, really 
helpful. And again, I've, there's some good iPad apps um, that have you know some pretty cool timers and stuff uh, right. that you can you know slide around and start the timer. And okay, I know I'm working on this one thing, and then I mm. I put it to sleep, um, and then just work on the one thing. That's something that, that I found that that's it's really kind of revolutionized. You know, because we're all kind of, oh, you know, hey, this is a cool idea. Oh, I, I wonder if I've gotten an email. And, you know, or it's mm -hmm. easy to do that. It's so easy to do that. It's not even funny. But right, you, right, you might right. want to, you know, t take a look at that to kind of take what you're doing to the next level. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely, yeah. I also found it, it's kind of good for me that um, I mean, you have normally in creativity you have these ideas of brainstorming, just writing down the ideas, getting out all the creativity and stuff like that. And, um, I found for myself that this is pretty useless. If you make a big list of ideas of what could happen or what the weapon should look like or stuff like that, um, you just end up with a big pile of very confusing stuff and you don't know where to go. And um, it, basically, it's just, I, I think you mostly you have kind of a red string in your mind. It's not evolved yet, but you have an idea of, okay, the game should work in this way so you have an idea what the weapon should be and it, it, it's it's much better to not get distracted and not try to be overly creative to create something new and different and I have seen this before so it has to be different because I mean right. all the big guys also don't do that they have the same things I mean look at look at fantasy for example there is always orcs there's always this kind of um, magicians and stuff like that so it's it's the same thing uh, you don't need to invent the wheel all the time and if you say okay I know this should look like that so this is an old guy with a stick and he can fly or something like that don't try to get distracted from that just focus on that and uh, uh, develop this um, one single thing that you from initially in the start thought okay this is a good idea and that's not go in all the different directions which I thought kind of helped me very much not to to get distracted and not to, especially um, with sound design or if, if you have graphic design or stuff, you have so much um, possibilities and if you have with sound design, you need to listen to all the different samples and tweak the sounds till they are right. It's so easy to get distracted and think, oh, this could also sound good. Maybe this is a better sound and stuff like that. And okay. to not go into that direction, not be lured on that track and say, yeah, I, I try it and I make this sound, I make 10 different versions, all put them in the game, all try them out, then come back. It's kind right. of, it, it never works. It never worked for me. You just lose days and days of time and um, uh, the, the, the project just goes uh, down the river. Um, it's, it, I think it's, uh, uh, for, I found for myself it's better to have a simple project that works than to have a very uh, thing that is intended to be very artistic and complex and, and uh, rethinking the, the, the genre or stuff like that, uh, but it's getting lost in all the details, which happens a lot to me. So I think, wow, cool, this is a nice game, I can write this in two weeks and then uh, half a year later it's, it's still in, in the first <laughs> level, you know, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like listing that you know some of the stuff out and you know and yeah it it is super easy and I found that it's way better to kind of okay I'm I'm gonna spend five minutes finding some stand-in sound and throw that in there and then when I get further along I'm gonna talk to somebody I know who does audio and you know see if I can talk them into it or spend a day on you know Audio Jungle and okay you know these are the songs I like and I mm -hmm. you know and I think that that's where it I found it really helps to collaborate with somebody and Absolutely. you know and put all these ideas in a Google document and say, you know, okay, hey, and you know, and I'll use uh, you know, red text and he uses green or something and we go through and you know, make notes. I actually used Google Wave. I'm like one of the three people who did and was sad when it went away because it was a really neat way to collaborate easily and see who was doing what. And some of that's transferred over into Google Docs to kind of throw stuff back and forth and say, you know, is this a good idea, you know, and and it, I guess it helps for me with my stuff that I know, okay, this is a really cool idea, but I know, while I don't know exactly how to do it, I know that's going to take a lot of time to implement from a 3D animation point of view. You know, I know that he's got his full-time job, and he's not going to be able to do this much stuff right now, or, you know, that wouldn't take that long in 3D, but having spent four hours, you know, trying to do this, that's going to take way too long to code, so we're going to scrap that at this point. You know, and you just kind of go from there. I mean, they say, you know, no battle plan 
ever survives con you know first contact with the enemy and I, and I've also heard you know no good game is ever fully designed on paper I think it really helps right, to have a right. plan but yeah you got to kind of adapt and move forward and I'm more interested in kind of you know picking out the vision that I've got and making it happen rather you know whether it's been done before or not it doesn't matter as much it's so much of it is in the execution you know and, and getting it done for me getting started is the easy part I love getting started and making a new prototype and hey I found a tutorial and now I made a game out of it and then I get bored you know and for me it's that figuring out which of the 80 different you know alpha versions prototypes that I've got do I spend time on or do I go back to my game I put out a year and a half ago and you know, put out a 1.1 1 .1 on that, you know, and that's, mm. you know, in those, you know, one hour or two hours or four hours out of a week. That's, that's the tricky part for me. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I think it's also, um, hmm, with, with games uh, that's, um, I always get lost in these things of where I think, okay, this and that, like you said, there is different kind of functions or ideas or stuff that could be interesting in the game and would make it more richer. And I think often um, we we draw our ideas uh, from the real world, so we we think in a in a, a kind of a, 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 how can I say in a system that is more. Um, practical in an everyday uh, way than logical in, in a game mechanic way. Uh, so often you wouldn't even need stuff, but you would implement it because in the real world it, worked, it would work like that. And um, uh, if, you, if you look at a lot of um, famous or successful games, the interesting thing that I find is how very reduced they are to just some very fundamental functions in the game and then they they made these functions very very good so they are the basic yeah. mechanics of that and the rest is either reusing the same functions in a different way or just making effects to make it look more than it is um, uh, but uh, it's it's always it, it, it zeroes in on, on one thing that is the main thing and then you have a little bit around that which is often not, not that good developed um, but is integrated in the story just to tell the story and and that's it. And this is where I often also get lost to say, okay, this and this and that would be cool um, to have in the game to make it more alive. And, and uh, this kind of uh, basic, I uh, I think every creative person has the feeling that this is not enough because you know the game yourself, you show it to other people, and you think, wow, this is so simple and so lame, and it's kind of it's not even a game. And other other people look at it and say, wow, it's really interesting, you know, like. Uh, Maybe stuff like Portal, for example. It's, it's pretty easy. You, you just have these portals, you throw them around, that's it. So it, it doesn't sound like much, but the game itself is really amazing because they, they used a, a small set of tools like you have in the editor of Portal 2 and built all the levels with it. So it's, it's basically you develop like all these a very limited number of things and then you arrange it in, a, in, a pre -made, in this kind of edit that they have and that's the game so they don't have merchants or upgrades or anything you have one weapon has one function and mm -hmm. that's it so that's that's really amazing I think to, to be able to do that it's kind of a, a, a main point to, to learn I think f inside of the organization of what to create and why and then you, you have a bigger uh, a better um, uh, system I think mm -hmm. for, for the creation to, to limit it to the absolute uh, minimum of what is uh, needed to 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 tell the story. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a, a phrase in startups: the MVP, the minimum viable product. And it's like, what is mm -hmm. the absolute bare minimum we can get away with? And I think, yeah, what you know, what we see in so many of the successful games, like whether it's Portal or Tiny Wings or Angry Birds, they took a very simple thing and then polished it to a crazy level. Angry Birds would not have done as well as it did if it didn't really sound good and feel good when you pulled that back and it shot mm -hmm. and the characters have some, you know, Wah! you know, and all that stuff. And they polished it. That was also like their 50th game. Everybody's like, ooh, Angry Birds. I'm like, yeah, they made 50 games before uh, yeah. that. And that's why, <laughs> you know, and if it wouldn't have been Angry Birds, it would have been their next one, you know, because they had mm -hmm. refined and figured out what worked and what didn't and, and got that super simple mechanic and just polished the heck out of it and refined it. And, you know, and I've got games that I've started that I've talked about with other people. Oh, we're going to build this. And it's like, I keep trying to get this one mechanic 
and I can't get it right. And until I, until we can get it right, I'm going to do something else. You know, we're not going to build that game because unless this one thing that the whole game is built around works, there's no point. There's no point in anybody doing any art. There's no point in any sounds. And it's a super cool concept. It's tobacco spitting rednecks. But you know, until one or two key things get in place, you know, the rest is just spinning wheels. And so I've I've started and restarted that like ten times. But it hasn't gone any further than you know me working on a prototype because until we get that just feeling fantastic, there's mm -hmm. no point. And I think you know it's easy to confuse activity with progress. You know, yeah. and, and, and we're making this, and I'm doing that, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and you know, mm -hmm. I, I have one game I made that um, I it, it's it's called Tower of Owls. You're stacking up these owls on the iPad every time you tap, and an owl drops, and they stack, and it's really cute, and people love it. And I found a mm -hmm. cool song on Audio Jungle, and yeah. and I found that when I got around seven or eight hundred owls stacked up in a row, they all fell down. And I thought that was because I was doing something wrong at that point. Well, it turns out that it was not. I was actually running up against physics limits in Unity. Oh, okay. But what I found is that once I fixed that, the game was not very interesting anymore because you could just sit and tap and tap and tap forever. Mm -hmm. and so I've got, you know, some other ideas. Well, maybe I'll make moving targets and things like that, but it's like until I do that, fixing the bug actually made the game really not very interesting anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, right, I think right, it's right. just one of those things you just you you got to kind of make it up as you go and no. you know. Ah, uh, there is also this uh, is I think an interesting question. If you because you learn always from games that you develop and from the experience and stuff like that, um, how to keep track of that? Because this is going on over years, and then you have something you maybe did two or three years ago, which was interesting. Um, uh, but to to have this kind of to to build a kind of um, archive of the different interesting ideas you had, the things that you learned, the kind of that worked good, uh, that people found interesting, stuff like that. And or often you have kind of these, um, how can I say, little, um, how do I say, if, if some uh, uh, actions follow on each other in a, in a certain way, then they are kind of funny, like you have in slapsticks or something, right. uh, how this comedy works. And this is also in games where you say, okay, if this comes after that and then this is the outcome, then this is nice to, to look at or this works as a, as, a, as a thing inside of the game. To remember all these kind of different things uh, because uh, what... I mean, what really attracted me to games is that games is basically everything. You have to know about all the things, story writing, coding, making music, uh, choreography, all that different kind of stuff. The problem on the, on the other side is like before I came from art, and you say, okay, I'm a painter, I can paint, and that's it. But in game development, you have to do everything. And uh, that's kind of where I think, wow, how can I remember all that? Like you found a, a nice solution how to do code or how to... In, in, implement a sound effect or how to connect the camera to a character to, so a certain effect is coming uh, uh, out of the game that has a nice mechanic in the end or stuff like that. Uh, how to organize that, I'm not sure right yet because it's so much input. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know that there is a good way. I mean, uh, you know, I know I keep mm. archives of all my scripts and when I find something that's useful and I can kind of make it come back, I make a Unity package and so, you know, I've got uh, a folder for all the various versions of the different things that I bought in the asset store, you know, mm -hmm. and then and there's several ones that I pull in right away um, whenever I start practically anything. But then I've also got, you know, a folder for my own scripts, and it's like, okay, the script kind of stands alone and has some useful things and some... And then I've, I've even got a subfolder of that. It's kind of a work in progress, and it's like, okay, this could be useful if I made it a little more abstract and a little more useful in every other situation, but then also, you know, mm -hmm. if I can get something working in kind of a its own scene, I'll export that as a Unity package and keep that. And so next time I know I can pull that in or, oh, I want to, you know, scrub through an animation. Well, I did that in this thing, you know, two years ago, and so i got to go get that. I don't know mm -hmm. that there is a, a good way to keep up with all that that's not in your brain. I wish there was. <laughs> But right, right, right. if there is, I don't know. Maybe maybe that's where the mind mapping software comes in. I don't know. 
I, I try to use Evernote a bit for that to write notes on that and include screenshots and describe what I'm, I did there and stuff like that. Uh, but the thing is, I get lost in my own Evernote collection of the notebooks yeah. and stuff like that. So I just, I just can't remember where it is or how I can find. And uh, sometimes I include tags in the notes so I can find it with the search for different kind of functions. Um, but I, it's, I mean, you write it as, I don't know, maybe um, good fighting idea. And then uh, later you use other words for the same thing. So you search for something completely right. different. And uh, you just can't find the note in kind of hundreds of different notes. So it's, it's always also a problem for me how to, to um, keep track of this stuff. So, yeah. Uh, and, I don't know. Uh, I also I have I'm kind of under the imagination that uh, there is not really a software that has been developed for that kind of purpose. Right? I mean to keep track of the assets, the ideas, the artworks, the originals, and stuff like that. Um, like uh, for example, you you can't. I don't know even uh, I don't know any sound software where you can tag all the sound files. Where you say okay, this sound is kind of nice and crispy, and this uh, kind of yeah. has a laser thing, and this is kind of an underwater. Um, stuff you can write it in the file name, and uh, again you have a really right. long file name for that. If you remember after uh, two years uh, what words you used in that file name, sure. Uh, but apart from that, there is not really a good um, uh, way to to organize it throughout all these very complex levels that uh, game design has in it. So that's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've often wished that the the operating system could you know do just you know tags like that where you know you could tag different things and and then search by that it seems like such a simple concept that seems like mm. somebody would have done that by now but yeah no that's definitely a, a challenge yeah uh, absolutely uh. Hmm. Mm, good stuff yeah, absolutely. It's kind of, uh, but it, it's nice to see that it's, it's the same way complicated for everybody. So yeah, it's it's uh, because normally I just feel stupid for not being able to do that, uh, but yeah. apparently it's kind of it's just hard, and there's not really a, a solution yet how to do that. So. Um, I can remember years ago, maybe five years ago, I made a own wiki on my. Um, I made a kind of. Um, how do you say virtual server on my computer, and then put yeah. a wiki on that, and try mm -hmm. to make all these wiki notes and stuff like that, um, which worked good for some time. But then, I, of course, I also got lost, and there are some kind of limitations of how you can interlink different things that you put in a wiki and stuff like that. So I kind of didn't work out. It was also it was a lot of work. It's kind of I think I, I, I then uh, found Evernote and use Evernote in a, a bit the same way, but at the same time, also Evernote has a problem that you can't really interlink the stuff very nice. So yeah. that's kind of uh, pretty complicated. Yeah, I've used a wiki in the past to keep up with stuff, and it, it's a good way for keeping up with some information. But mm -hmm. it's, I've found it's really hard to get anybody else to use it. <laughs> and, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. But and what I really wonder is stuff like, for example, if you have Star Trek and they have what? How many seasons does, does Star Trek: New Generation have? Nine or something or ten? Yeah. And they have all these races and the story plots and the f kind of um, character features that each each of the persons has and stuff like that. And they have to kind of, I mean, often they lose track and build something that they find the fans find out that kind of it doesn't work uh, that way. Um, but, but mostly they 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 manage to keep track of this kind of whole universe of things, and um, I really wonder what kind of system they use because it's kind of there are so many people and they change over the years from the team and from the actors and stuff like that, and you still have to and you have I guess they have a lot of writers who write the stories from them who have to be in the same style. How they do that, I don't know. It's, it's they they have somebody uh, I I don't know about Star Trek, but I know like for Lost. They had one person or a team of people that were like consistency people, and they went through everything because they knew if they didn't, the fans would, and then shred them for it. Uh -huh. That made sure that everything was consistent, you know, within its own you know world of what they did. 
Ah, okay. Yeah. So they're just experts on the Star Trek plot and know all the yeah. differences. Yeah, I, and I guess have gone through the material so much that they know this is not how that character would act, or this is not, mm -hmm. you know, what happened, or the last time this happened, you know, it was like this. Yeah, I would yeah, not yeah. want that job. <laughs> By the not way, want this... That job. This uh, just uh, just had an idea. This uh, this uh, is interesting. In anime uh, movies, it is. I don't know if it's really like that, but I have heard. Um, you can tell from the character's hair color uh, what kind of character he has because they have purple and green and red and all these kind of different colors. And if he has purple hair, he is like that. And if he's red hair, he is like that. So. Uh, that that is kind of interesting. If you use that uh, for for uh, in in games, that you say I use always the same kind of features, and if I come back five years later and I know I have this character and he has a red rose in his pocket, then he has uh, he's kind of a Casanova or whatever. So right. I can just tell from the features, and I don't have to, to to just serialize or just categorize that the things that you put into the games, which. Um, for, for example, I find a, a good example is um, Stanley Kubrick for that um, because although he worked in a lot of different genres and always made iconic films for them, if you watch the films one after another, you will find that they are all built the same way and then most of the movies he's using the same camera moves, the same kind of how he's using the actors and stuff like that. Um, so they are pretty similar. Uh, he just adapts it to a new concept, even as horror or science fiction or some other thing that he's doing. But basically, he uses the same tools uh, in different ways. So that that's pretty interesting. So they they all seem very very unique his films, but actually they're not that unique in in the way they he he is using his his his, um, his artistic skills. So that's that's kind of maybe this is kind of a, um, a solution on how they work on these bigger projects. Um, to just categorize it and say, okay, this guy, if he has this character, he has to look that way. So, um, which is also, uh, I think, a, a good way for the players to understand how your game world wor look, uh, works. If they can look at the character and just from the look tell, okay, he has that features, that powers, that kind of morals and stuff like that. Uh, from the just from the design, the clothing, uh, the kind of how the weapon looks, um, how the character feels, and stuff like that. But that could be a good way to to um, uh, burn it down, make it simpler for 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 the game developers to to work on their on their own stuff, maybe, and to come back after years and say, "Oh, we make a sequel for that." I have no idea what the game was. So, right, <laughs> but right. you, if you look at the designs, you can tell, "Ah, okay, he has this kind of features and stuff." So maybe that's a good way. Well, yeah, guys, I gotta run. All my family hey, is up and yeah, waiting thank you for guys me so and all that stuff. Cool. I really enjoyed this. Stuff. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, Jesse, thing. did you record all of the hangout or? Yeah, yeah, I got one accidental Minecraft shot, but everything else, yes, all two hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool, wow. cool. So That's please uh, uh, post the link when you when you upload yeah, I just, it. I just gotta edit some of the because uh, I have two audio tracks. So let me just edit some of that stuff and I'll send a link to you and uh, the post. Cool. Also. Very nice. Very and cool. I think like a bunch of people recorded this on YouTube too. I think so. We got a bunch really? of plan B's and C's and D's and E's. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. How do you record it on YouTube? Is there some well, kind of plugin? I, I think like it automatically records the the live hangout. But if it didn't work, I got ScreenFlow. So none of us really showed code, except for yeah. uh, Greg's awesome iPad app. So I don't need yeah. Zoom right yeah. now, which is good. Yeah. yeah. Now it it uh, the, the thing is I didn't make it a live hangout because I didn't know you have to make the event live and oh. not the hangout. So <laughs> that's why it's not live at the moment. That's all good. So <laughs> it's really good that you have the recording, but next time uh, it will be live. Good. So, oh, yeah. Thanks again. Cool. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thanks,